years ago, I used to serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Representatives. Now I've moved over to the Appropriations Committee and then the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee of Appropriations. So we're not talking about the policy, we're writing checks for the policy, which is a distinction, but I'm glad I'm there. But a number of years ago in a Foreign Affairs Committee on religious minorities in the Middle East, after the committee was done, a young man comes sprinting, running down the hallway, right at me. That makes you a little nervous in Congress. And he said, Congressman, Congressman, do you understand? Do you understand what you've done? This is the first time anyone has ever talked about Christians in the Middle East. And it was a revelation to me of sorts. This was a young man from Detroit who was of the Chaldean faith tradition. And so we have large pockets of religious minorities, one of which is in Detroit, and you're from out west, and Los Angeles is another, and throughout, Lebanese are of course all over the world. As uh, Cardinal Al Rai told me, he says, Lebanese are born and they look to the sea. Yes. I was one time in Liberia, the, there was one hotel that survived their civil war, run by the Lebanese, very resilient. Mm -hmm. But the idea here being that this was an awakening for me as well to understand the, the, the history in a more rich way of the Christian populations of the Middle East. And then when the, the Iraq War ended, but ISIS began and the genocide took place, the springing up of people in the diaspora around this idea of creating an association to elevate America and the international community's consciousness around the persecution of Christian and other religious minorities to me was a breath of fresh air. So IDC and the work that they've been doing to socialize, to create a, a unity among the diaspora, among people who come from there, but had really no way of associating, to me has been very extraordinarily helpful in creating a dynamic in Congress where more and more people understand that this is not just a policy priority because of the refugee situation or because of immigration. It's about the principles of humanity, the principles of civilization itself. So I want to thank IDC for their sacrifice in creating, again, this unique unifying movement among various traditions to raise consciousness to the world about the plight and the persecutions of, of religious minorities, but also the necessity to help people return and reestablish their ancient traditions for the benefit of all people. My name is Tufik Baklini. I am the president of In Defense of Christians, IDC, a nonprofit 501c3 organization that's committed to the protection and preservation of Christianity in the Middle East. Atrocities, persecution, exodus. Words barely describing the agony of the Christians and other minorities of the Middle Eastern North African region. Action was needed, and IDC came to the rescue. In 2014, during its first summit, IDC secured a successful meeting between former President Obama and eight Eastern Christian leaders, briefing him about the situation of Christians and other minorities in the Middle East. Soon after, the international military intervention against ISIS began. Christians and other minorities were being persecuted at genocide levels in the Middle East, posing an existential threat to one of the region's oldest religions. And we at IDC were determined to stay laser focused on bringing justice to the families of victims of genocide committed by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And by the grace of God, we succeeded. Through his continued advocacy and meetings with members of Congress and U.S. administration, IDC successfully secured another big achievement during his 2017 summit with Vice President Mike Pence's announcement that the United States will directly support the Christians and Yazidis in Iraq and Syria. And from this day forward, America will provide support directly to persecuted communities through USAID. Following the announcement, 
the United States added over $178 million in U.S. foreign assistance to support vulnerable communities in Iraq, bringing the total U.S. assistance for this population to nearly $300 million. In 2018, IDC proudly celebrated the presidential signing of the Iraq and Syria Genocide Relief and Accountability Act, House Resolution 390 passed earlier by Congress. Fearing that Christianity is facing the possibility of being wiped out in parts of the Middle East, IDC once again lobbied and petitioned members of Congress to represent and adopt House Resolution 259 to support the repatriation of religious and ethnic minorities in Iraq to their ancestral homelands. What's alarming is that the latest census showed that in Syria, the Christian population declined from 1.7 million to less than 450,000. And in Iraq, Christian numbers slumped from 1.5 million to less than 120,000. The majority of the exodus was directed to Lebanon, considered to be the last bastion of Christianity in the Middle East, a country currently hosting over 2 million refugees who are creating an unsustainable economic and social crisis. IDC continues to work relentlessly to ensure that the United States stands with Lebanon and the Lebanese army in its fight against terrorism, so Lebanon would remain a safe haven for religious freedom in the Middle East. IDC's focus expanded to support Coptic Christians in Egypt with the presentation of House Resolution 49, urging the Egyptian government to enact serious and legitimate reforms to ensure that Coptic Christians have the same rights and opportunities as other Egyptian citizens, and to take the steps to end the cultural impunity for attacks on Christians. What also should be noted, that other countries like Iran and Turkey continue fostering hostile environment against Christians at the state level, and we at IDC have been following that closely and proudly claim that we played a role in building support to secure the release of Pastor Andrew Brunson. In addition, IDC continues to advocate, lobby, and support House Resolution 296, affirming the United States record on Armenian genocide and Senate Resolution 150, asking the United States to commemorate the Armenian genocide through official recognition and remembrance. Is in strong support of this uh, resolution, House Resolution 296, which affirms the Armenian genocide. Uh, this is an historic day in the House of Representatives, and it's one that I've been waiting for for 27 years. IDC's continuous efforts to raise awareness to the agony of persecuted Christians in the Middle Eastern North African region were also highlighted this year with a historic ecumenical prayer service held at the U.S. Capitol on July 15, 2019. Prayers were recited and hymns sung in the ancient languages of the Middle East at the Rotunda. Faith leaders from different Middle Eastern and American churches, along with congressional members and dignitaries participating in the event, called for a stronger response to the genocide and all atrocities against the Christians and other minorities. I and my team at the State Department are 100% behind the work that In Defense of Christians does. You help provide emergency aid to those in need. You amplify the voices of those who otherwise would have no voice. There are several wonderful organizations all over the world advocating for the persecuted Christians in the Middle East. They are real heroes and they deserve all of our respect. They work mostly locally on a humanitarian scale, bringing relief to the affected communities. Don't get me wrong, that's also a really, really necessary work. But in my opinion, the real merit of IDC is operating on a holistic scale, focusing on the big picture, raising awareness and uh, working on uh, one of the main centers of Western power, which is uh, Washington, D.C. What they do congregating the American politicians from both sides of the aisle, and even more difficult, bringing the, almost all the historical Christian leaders together, is really a Herculean job. I think Ms. Baclini and I share the same concept that all the Christians in the Middle East are on the same boat. 
and, uh, and only together we can overcome this uh, present scenario. We also agree that the situation is as urgent as can be. We need a major strategy to deal with the problem and I see that IDC is trying to pave the way for that strategy by educating and influencing the American politicians. The work of IDC is really, really extraordinary. In Defense of Christians, I think, is one of the most important organizations now working on the issue of religious persecution. You know, you have people working on the issue in the United States and in Europe, and there's been a lot of good work that's been done. I think what IDC brings that's unique is that they bring, they bring a regional sensibility. I think uh, because the organization at the leadership level uh, is from the Middle East, is from the Christian communities who are actually facing persecution, they have a better sense for what's going on and what's possible in terms of advocacy. So we work with IDC as much as possible. I consider them uh, really our, our agent in Washington. You know, we do a lot of education, we do a lot of advocacy, but what IDC does, we can't do. Walking the hills of, of or walking the halls of Congress, uh, meeting with leaders, uh, educating on Capitol Hill, these are things that, that only IDC can do. It's a great to see so many of you here to support the Christians of the Middle East. Thank you. You've come from chapters from California, Arizona, Colorado, Texas, Minnesota, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, New York, and the Washington DC area and elsewhere. I grew up in the Midwest and I got involved with IDC uh, because I took a, po I did a policy fellowship with a partner organization of IDCs uh, called the Philos Project and traveled in the Middle East and I got, while I was over there I got to spend time with uh, Iraqi Christian refugees who'd fled to Jordan uh, during a visit we made to Jordan. And hearing their stories and getting to know their, the challenges that they were facing in their, in their home country of Iraq. Uh, was really touching and was not something I've been exposed to before. Growing up in you know rural Midwest America, you don't hear a lot about the church in the East. Uh, and then we also got to spend time visiting some really old uh, Christian communities and realizing. I think it was it was for me it was an eye-opening moment to see that you know really that's you know, not only is the root of, is it the you know kind of the roots of the church historically but it's kind of still really the home the heartland of the church is real still really still there in the middle east uh, that history has continued and i think uh, as you know someone who comes from a western tradition we think of the of christianity as sort of a western 
kind of theology ideology, but seeing that it really the roots and the heart of the church is from the Middle East and the rich tradition of the church is in the Middle East uh, really uh, was something that was compelling to me and made me think me. There has to be some way to be more involved uh, and be an advocate for this community. And that was when uh, I was connected with uh, In Defense of Christians and had the opportunity to come start working with the organization. Sure, my name is Adam Ampre and I work with the Armenian National Committee of America. We're a, a national advocacy group. We represent um, Americans of Armenian heritage, uh, other friends of Armenia. We work with uh, Congress, the White House, State Department, um, the media, think tanks, coalition partners. One of our uh, greatest coalition partners is in fact In Defense of Christians uh, and we cooperate on a whole range of issues. Uh, we have been blessed to work with uh, In Defense of Christians. IDC has been among our, our closest partners. We rely upon them for, for counsel, for advice, for support. So I've been with IDC now for a little over two years. And the reason why I joined the organization is because as someone who has a heritage uh, in the Middle East and in Lebanon specifically, I felt very morally compelled uh, to want to take action uh, to support Christians in the Middle East, especially in light of what uh, ISIS was uh, committing in light of the genocide that ISIS was committing against Christians and other minorities uh, in Iraq and Syria. For the two years I've been with the organization, I've had the pleasure of managing all of our grassroots political organizing. We have over 35 chapters across the country, as well as over 100 advocates that we work with to have them meet with their members of Congress uh, locally and in Washington, D.C. And then furthermore, there are tens of thousands of people who are engaged on Facebook as well as other social media platforms. So a huge portion of my responsibility is mobilizing these people, getting them to reach out to their elected officials and get members of Congress and senators to support our communities in the Middle East. I also work with our religious advisory board, uh, which is composed of all the bishops of the Middle Eastern churches as well as Western Christian leaders, such as Roman Catholics, Evangelicals, and others. The most important thing that we need is for the work that IDC, uh, for the work that we're doing, to be strengthened and made more sustainable. So when it comes to Washington, D.C., uh, pretty much all of the think tanks, universities, other advocacy organizations, are going to be heavily funded in many instances by foreign governments themselves or by donors who are aligned with foreign governments. IDC is really the only, really the leading voice in Washington that's willing to go out there and criticize not Saudi Arabia or Iran, but IDC will criticize Saudi Arabia and Iran, you know, and Turkey, any country that violates human rights. That's the really distinct thing is that you have a lot of good reports, information, advocacy initiatives about the Middle East, but no one's consistent. And so this organization is consistently applying pressure to governments across the board and, you know, and equally in really prioritizing this right. That's the most important thing. So we've got to grow. We want to make IDC stronger. Um, there's a lot of organizations in Washington that really have the attention of lawmakers and we've done a great job getting a genocide recognition getting aid delivered uh, to Christians in Iraq and Syria, getting multiple pieces of legislation passed, but we, we need to grow. We want to be bigger and we want to be a force because this is kind of a long-term struggle that we're facing in the region. These problems aren't going to go away tomorrow. And so we want to make sure the IDC is going to be here for years to come. I think uh, an important point to make is these aren't uh, this isn't a, a boutique human rights issue or just a fringe issue that's nice to address when we get time, but these are at the center of these questions of stability and conflict and peace and flourishing are really these questions of religious identity and being able to live together with those whom you disagree in in a place like Iraq, the, the fragmentation of, of the country is happening along the lines where the, in the homelands of these minority communities where the Yazidis and the Christians and the Shabak and the Turkoman, their homelands are the places where these conflicts are being worked out. So to treat them as a fringe or boutique issue is to, to take one of a critical piece of solving the puzzle and take it off the table. And so these need to be at the heart of our understanding of these issues. 
I think the persecution of Christians is one of the most urgent matters of our day. And I think that it's very possible that within my own lifetime, certainly within the lifetime of my children, that Christians could be almost gone or completely gone from the Middle East. I think it's very conceivable. This is a very likely scenario. I think there's been a lot of uh, talk, there's been a lot of conferences, a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, some campaigns, some rallies. Uh, and in the meantime, the numbers, the population of Christians in the Middle East is just plummeting. Is it too late? Maybe. I think in some parts of the region, yes, it probably is too late. But there are still a few places in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Iraq, and in Syria where we still can do something. And I think the longer we wait, the, longer we wait, the less likely it is that anything is going to, going to change. Cardinal World, a friend with whom I organized last year's historic summit, has said that atrocities occur because there are those who are prepared to commit them and those who remain silent. Of course, we will not be silent, but our voices must also be a unified voice. We must continue to organize. Like many of you, I'm a Christian from the Middle East, where Christianity has struggled to survive since its first century. In the two millennia since, Christians have taken refugees, refuge in the desert, monasteries of Egypt, and the mountains of the Levant. We have survived slaughter in Mesopotamia. In all these places, we will thrive again one day. Christianity will survive. But I do know that we must strongly defend uh, the human rights of Christians and of all people uh, in the Middle East and all around the world. Uh, it's time to put a stop to genocide. Uh, it's the ultimate um, negation of what Jesus Christ taught us. Jesus Christ taught us that we only have one race the human race. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all children of God. That's, that's why I do believe we'll win. I had the amazing experience once after we had a big rally in the middle of Kiev during the Ukrainian independence movement of walking back down Khrushchev, which is this big, gorgeous you know, street in the middle of Kiev, and it was at the time when all of the uh, chestnut trees were blooming. And I w walked into one of the Orthodox churches. And this little lady, she must have been about four feet tall, but she was this really tiny woman. And she pulled me down by my lapels. And she said, Vimil Vin. And of course, I didn't understand her at first. I, and, and then she pulls me down again and she says, we will win. We will win. Because, and then she said, because it is God's work. Because it is God's work. And that's the way I believe 